I'm Edie Lash and I'm here in the Hub Culture Pavilion. I'm now joined by Dr. Ewan Burney. Thanks very much. You're here from the, I'm going to have to say it again, it's the, it's the EBI, right? The AMBL EBI. Now yeah. tell me what that is. So the EBI is part of EMBL, which is a bit like uh, CERN for molecular biology. It's an international, European international treaty organization. Mm -hmm. And at the European Bioinformatics Institute, the EBI, we look after the public information around the Human Genome Project, the Mouse Genome Project, mm -hmm. and we have new genomes like wheat and barley, chickpea, and all sorts coming in. Now, it's not just about genomes for us. There's also a lot of other molecules that are very, very important, but probably the thing that the public knows best mm -hmm. is genomes. So that's interesting. So tell me about the opportunities in DNA technology. So we're very in a very exciting place. Ten years ago, the human genome was sequenced. And over the last 10 years, a huge amount of research has occurred, and some of it has been heading towards the clinic. My interactions with clinicians have gone up considerably. Uh, I have some great colleagues who work in London, they're cardiologists, and they're now moving to the situation where they can see, oh, I can use this piece of genomics technology, not just for research, but for routine use in the lab. Now, these are perhaps early days, but for me, it's, it's much further than research was. This is really asking the question, can we make this work for doctors? Can we change how doctors make decisions? Sometimes that's about diagnosing what a patient has, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's about a patient that has a diagnosis and you're saying, should it be this treatment or that treatment? I know there's also applications in agriculture, food security. So how does that work? And you mentioned chickpea and barley and yeah. wheat. So uh, of course, every living thing is made from the, the same fundamental molecules. DNA is uh, uh, the same in wheat as it is in humans. In fact, for a genome like wheat, it's actually got a much bigger genome than in humans, and so it's been a challenge uh, to do this. But because of the, ad uh, the advances in DNA technology over the last decade, we can really tackle the wheat genome. Now, that's very exciting, because if we can think about improving by breeding strategies, perhaps by genetic modification, these crops making them more drought tolerant, making them perhaps more soil tolerant, making them more pest resistant, making them more appropriate for different climates, then we can really, really start to address some of the food source shortages, not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world. Now, that's when I've met some of my colleagues from India. They say wheat, shmeat, they go chickpea, pigeon pea. There's a whole bunch of other crops, mm -hmm. millet. These crops have never really been gone through an intensive breeding program that had happened in, for example, in wheat in the 1950s and 1960s. So there's a lot of opportunity about how we can improve these crops in the future. It's another very important uh, application area for genomics broadly and the other molecular technologies that's also wrapped up in that. How well understood do you think your area is, or do people immediately start saying, <gasps> genetic changing the genome, can't be safe, what happens if? Uh, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a plus and minus. We have people in CSI saying, oh, I found DNA. Yeah? Right. And you have adverts out here in Davos that says, DNA is part of our, you know, this, this is part of our, our corporate DNA. Yeah? Right. So I think there is a, a, an understanding. In fact, I think there's an appreciation at some level. Perhaps, in fact, even more, it's overemphasized. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's too powerful a word now in, mm -hmm. this, in the way it's used. Um, and yet you do get some of these, uh, these concerns as well. And most of those concerns, from my perspective, as you, as when you meet people and you talk them through them, you step them through what, what actually happens and how things are regulated and how the process works, people are very uh, reassured. But it is absolutely critical that... There's, there's two things. Scientists engage with the public and talk about what they're doing and talk about why they're doing it. And the second thing is to just repeat again and again, it, it has to be stated again and again, which is that science here is, you know, it's our choice as a society about how we use this and how we regulate mm -hmm. and how we do it. And uh, sometimes people, I think, sometimes have this image of scientists who, who perhaps step outside of these boxes and... and they really don't. We spend a lot of time worrying about uh, crafting, uh, you know, working inside the, the regulation, regulation that we have. Um, again, in the UK, for example, uh, that's done really quite responsibly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's appropriate. Ewan, thanks so much for coming by the Hub Pavilion here in okay. Davos, and I'm Edie Lush. Wow.